And with histamine intolerance is an absolute game changer for providing my clients with really, really a lot of benefit in regards to the treatment of their histamine um, pores and the symptoms that they're getting from their histamine intolerance and for preventing the histamine intolerance from coming back, okay? So the most, you know, in my mind, the most important digestive enzyme we really have is hydrochloric acid. Now, humans have evolved to have a highly acidic stomach, more than a lot of other animals, okay? And this is actually because we were... Um, exposed to its growth but to our feces a lot when we were sort of in primitive um, the, the primitive man and what would happen is the hydrochloric acid would prevent the bad bacteria from feces and also from food getting into the small intestine okay so what can happen due to many environmental factors including stress taking proton pump inhibitors, which are reflux medication, zinc deficiency, eating a lot of processed foods, we can be, or not eating enough animal protein, we can become deficient in hydrochloric acid. So what is going to happen is you are going to get bad bacteria growing in your gut, okay, which is a major cause of histamine issues, okay. So when we need to understand when the body is in fight and flight, it's not in rest and digest. And that sounds like a like a whatever, simple thing, but it's actually really, really, really important to get your head around because when your body's stressed out, you are simply not secreting adequate amounts of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so with hydrochloric acid, I want you need to really consider all the signs and symptoms of low hydrochloric acid. Okay, so I've written them all in my book. There's about, there's seriously about 15 signs of hydrochloric acid. Um, you know, one of them really is that indigestion feeling, undigested food in your stools. It is also a major sign. Um, if you've got eczema or B12 deficiency, rosacea, that also indicates that you potentially have low hydrochloric acid. Okay, so there are many, many issues that go on with low hydrochloric acid. Okay, now, when the brain detects that hydrochloric acid is being released from the stomach, it sets off a cascade of triggers, hormones get triggered, which they should, to start the digestion process. Now, one of the important things it does is it tells the pancreas to release pancreatic juice and pancreatic juice along with pancreatic enzymes move into the small intestine. Now, pancreatic juice is an alkalizing substance. So stomach acid, hydrochloric acid is acidic, should be, and then the small intestine is supposed to be an alkaline environment. It's the, um, the bicarbonate in the pancreatic juice that does that. If it doesn't do that, then it is a breeding ground. It's more acidic and it's a breeding ground for bad bacteria, which is SIBO, okay? Now, the pancreatic enzymes, okay, so we've got many different types of pancreatic enzymes, and they are really, really important for the digestion of carbohydrate and starch, as well as fats and proteins, okay, so they have a really broad acting role. Some of the signs and symptoms of pancreatic enzyme insufficiency can be um, you can have fatty stools, you can have diarrhea. You can have issues with your absorption of fat-soluble nutrients like vitamin A, D, E, and K, okay? And when there is an insufficiency in pancreatic enzymes, you will often feel like you are really, really bloated after eating meals, okay? Or hydrochloric acid as well, but pancreatic enzymes deficiency, you'll feel really, really bloated after eating, after eating okay? Now, the other digestive enzyme that gets released when the brain detects that there's hydrochloric acid, is bile acids, okay? Now, bile acids are there to break down fat, which is very, very important. If we don't absorb our fats properly, we become, again, deficient in fat-soluble nutrients, okay? Now, if we're not absorbing our fats properly and they're unbound, 
They are going to cause issues with things like cholesterol, okay, because you can't bind up your cholesterol. You also can't bind up your hormones because bile acids bind up to hormones to actually help excrete them in the stools, okay. The other thing that can happen is that if you are deficient in bile acids, you are also rendering your gut open to bad bacteria because bile acids are also really antimicrobial, okay. So what I see clinically is if there is a slight um, hindrance or lack of any of the digestive enzymes, you would, you would sort of say even a 5% reduction in any of them can absolutely cause a cascade of gut issues, okay, because it only takes a small amount of these bad bugs to get into your gut and they will start to proliferate and grow, okay. So I've written a lot about digestive enzymes in my book and all the signs and symptoms around um, deficiencies as well as um, the, um, the, the symptoms that they cause and why you can get a reduction in these important digestive enzymes. Now, another digestive enzyme that's not really well known is called the brush border enzymes. Now, brush border enzymes are made locally in the small intestine and they are stored in the microvilli, the tiny little hairs in the small intestine. And what can happen due to SIBO, the inflammation that SIBO causes, you'll have a reduction in the um, capacity to make and excrete these brush border enzymes. Okay, now brush border enzymes, there's a few of them and four of them are actually specific for the digestion and, and breakdown of carbohydrate one being lactose, okay? So a lot of people are deficient in, well, it's the enzyme is called lactase, okay? And it breaks down lactose in dairy. So often people can have a dairy intolerance due to a deficiency in the lactase enzyme, this brush border enzyme, due to all the inflammation that's occurring due to the SIBO. So often if you fix the SIBO, your ability to actually tolerate some dairy does um, become a lot better, okay? So they're the really important digestive enzymes that we need to think about when treating histamine intolerance because if they're actually not there, you're going to get a buildup of bad bacteria in the gut and you're going to have issues with absorption of important at the breakdown of um, and absorption of important nutrients. So, you know, going back to hydrochloric acid, you know, hydrochloric acid needs to be released to activate pepsin. So pepsin is excreted in the form called pepsinogen and it's actually not active until it's acted on by this acidic hydrochloric acid. And then pepsin is what starts to digest protein. And without protein, you are not going to be methylating well because protein is essential for the, um, the amino acids that are required for methylation, okay, which is predominantly the sulfur-based amino acids, methionine and cysteine, okay? So you need protein. You need to be breaking it down. You need to be absorbing it. And you also need vitamin B12. So without hydrochloric acid and pepsin, you cannot actually break down your protein, extract and um, absorb B12 properly. And B12 is absolutely essential for methylation. So B12 takes methylfolate into the methionine cycle to create SAMI, the methyl donor. Okay, so what can happen is you're going to get issues with Dow enzyme because of all the inflammation in the gut and you're going to get in issues with methylation and you won't have enough methyls for the functioning of the histamine methyltransferase enzyme, which is in the brain, which breaks down histamine in the brain. And furthermore, if you don't have enough methyls, you're going to have issues with the detoxification of estrogen through the liver via the COMPT enzyme. Okay, so we can see hydrochloric acid is essential for preventing histamine issues and for actually treating them. Okay. So I've got some questions come through. So Leonie wants to know where she can can she buy these brush border enzymes. Now there's actually um, 
for as far as I know, not a lot of products that actually contain the brush water enzyme, but there's one called Pure Encapsulations Digestive Enzymes Ultra. It's my favorite digestive enzyme. It contains pancreatic enzymes as well as all of the brush border enzymes. So for SIBO patients in particular, this can really, really help them start breaking down the plant foods into the smallest molecules so that it can be absorbed a lot better. Okay, so Pure Encapsulations Digestive Enzymes Ultra, you can buy it online often from um, iHerb or Amazon or potentially directly from their website. Um, so Rich has got a question, which is, can I take um, apple cider vinegar to increase hydrochloric acid? So Richard, yes, it does um, increase the release of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, I often don't use it clinically that much because it's often just not enough, okay? Now, if there is, you know, if hydrochloric acid needs to be in really, really good amounts, to prevent the bad bacteria getting into the gut and for really, really providing the right environment to break down your protein to get the B12 and the sulfur-based amino acids. So I tend to supplement with hydrochloric acid because I simply see people get really, really, really good results with symptoms from getting their hydrochloric acid up. However, if apple cider vinegar is helping you with the digestion of your protein, then that's great. You can absolutely take it. Um, so Julia has a question, which is, can you increase bile acids naturally? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, what, what we need to understand about bile acids is they are actually made from methylation. Methylation is really important. For making bile acids okay so what the bile acids need phospholipids to to form you need phospholipids to form bile acids and you make phospholipids from methylation okay so it comes back to how important it is to have good gut absorption so that you can absorb the important nutrients for methylation okay so Correcting methylation will correct your synthesis of bile acids as long as your liver is healthy and that your gallbladder is healthy. Okay. Now, there are some lovely herbs that can stimulate the production of bile in the liver, and they are called cologogs. And cologogs, no, they're called choleretic, sorry, guys, my herbal medicine. I've it's been a while since I've looked at my herbs. So choleretics are types of herbs that stimulate the production of bile in the liver, and they include antigraphis, dandelion leaf, dandelion root, globe artichoke. These are really nice choleretic herbs. I've got there's a whole list of them in my book if you want to check it out. And then there are cologog herbs, and cologog herbs actually help the release of bile acids from the gallbladder. They include barberry, dandelion root, globe artichoke, yellow dock. There's a few more, okay? So having a lovely herbs mix can really help support the liver and the gallbladder in producing and releasing bile acids. Now, what you have to be very careful with with bile acids is that if you have SIBO, the SIBO bacteria can deconjugate bile acids, meaning it breaks apart the bile acids, and they're therefore um, they they're not they they're not active in that way in that unbound form, and they will start to damage the gut. Okay, and they will also cause issue with calcium malabsorption because unbound fats will bind up calcium, and if you don't have enough calcium, you can't break down your oxalate, which is a really huge cause of histamine issues okay so if you're concerned about bile acids and want to read more I've really detailed all about why we need bile acids the signs and symptoms of deficiency the causes of deficiency and what you can do about it in my book okay um, so Daniel's got a question is it recommended to take hydrochloric acid until you get a burning sensation in the stomach now I, I don't believe in this a lot of people come to me saying oh 
I was told to take hydrochloric acid until my stomach started burning, which meant I had enough. And some of these people were literally taking like eight capsules per meal, which is just crazy. Okay. So as a rule, you probably only need to take about five, 500 milligrams to one gram of hydrochloric acid. That should be ample. Um, so Kabita's got um, a question, which is a bit of a three-part question. So she gets bloating and inflammation during the luteal phase of her menstrual cycle. So the luteal phase is from ovulation through to bleed. Okay, so she said it starts on day 15, which is, would be her ovulation. And she said she's fine in the follicular phase. So the follicular phase is the, the lead-up phase, the two weeks before ovulation. Now she wants to know if this can, is this histamine related. And it absolutely can be. What we need to understand is that to have a healthy luteal phase where you feel you don't feel inflamed, you don't have fluid retention, you don't have puffiness, you don't have PMS mood issues, you need to have really healthy follicles that grow in a, in a nice linear fashion from day one to day 15, 14, 15 when you ovulate because ovulation makes progesterone. So when you're having all these terrible PMS symptoms in the luteal phase, it's often due to um, an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone, okay? So if you have issues with inflammation and histamine, okay, the inflammation is going to cause issues with follicle quality. So your follicles are not going to be healthy, so your ovulation won't be great. And if you do have problems with histamine, it is actually stimulating the ovaries to produce more estrogen, okay? So if you have more estrogen compared to progesterone, you're going to have a terrible time in your luteal phase, okay? So absolutely, inflammation and histamine is going to cause massive issues with luteal phase, physical symptoms and emotional mental symptoms. Um, so she wants to know what tests you can do about this. Now, if you're getting a regular 28-day menstrual cycle, then you really don't need to test your hormones to, to start because they're probably going to be in range. It's all about what is going on with the gut microbiome, okay, because the microbiome is causing havoc with the deconjugation of estrogen, it's causing issues with histamine. So you first of all need to start with a SIBO test as well as, well as doing a really good comprehensive digestive stool analysis to start looking at the microbiome in the gut and fixing that because that will reduce inflammation, it will reduce histamine, and it will also support the, absorptions, the absorption of nutrients you need for methylation. Okay, so methylation is what detoxifies estrogen through the liver. Okay, so gut needs to be working well, liver methylation pathways need to be working well so that you can have a healthy ovulation and a more balanced menstrual cycle. And the last part of this question, which is, it, which is an interesting question, is, is it possible to develop SIBO or LIBO, large bowel dysbiosis, during the luteal phase? So no, it's not possible just to have it during that phase. It's, you've always got it. It's just the fact that your hormones are so impacted by gut issues, right, because, because the bad bacteria in the gut deconjugate estrogen, meaning it's more active, you have more estrogen, and all the histamine that gets released from bad gut issues is going to stimulate the production of more estrogen. And the net result of that is an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone. Now, Hormones are so powerful. Just having slight um, variations in the amount of these hormones you have can cause a lot of symptoms. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Kavita, because it's, um, yeah, treating the gut first and foremost when you're dealing with hormonal issues is, is really important. Um, so Sass has a question, which is, can... Low neutrophils and low white, white blood cells indicate histamine intolerance. So um, neutrophils are, one of, are white blood cells, so white blood cells are immune cells, and they absolutely can 
identify that you have chronic inflammation. When your white blood cells are high, it means it's acute. You know, like you've got a severe viral infection or a severe um, acute bacterial infection and you will feel sick, malaise symptoms, right, flu symptoms often. But when they're low, it means that there's chronic low-grade inflammation happening in the body, which is often coming from a bacterial overgrowth, okay, and it's often in the gut, okay. And if we know that if there's bacterial overgrowth in the gut, whether it's a small bowel or a large bowel, it is going to cause histamine to be increased due to the inflammation, increasing histamine release from the cell, a reduction in Dow enzyme synthesis, as well as a potential issue with leaky gut, okay, as well as all the nutrient malabsorption. Okay, so when anyone comes to me with their white blood cells low, it's like absolutely we need to do gut testing. Unless, unless there's another other reason absolutely why they know they have that, which could potentially be something like heavy metal toxicity, then we're going to start looking at the gut microbiome to sort of ascertain why they have this chronic low-grade inflammation. Uh, so Michelle has a question, which is, since I have SIBO and high histamine, does this mean I need to take all the digestive enzymes you have been talking about? So, Michelle, it's, it's not that everyone with SIBO and histamine issues needs to take digestive enzymes. We need to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis, okay, because there's no point in taking things that you don't need, okay? So, number one, be very careful with taking oxphile if you have SIBO active because more, um, more bile acids are going to cause more deconjugation, so you have more deconjugated bile acids and more bile acids to, um, that are deconjugated, which really damage the gut. So be really careful with that. Um, but, Michelle, I really, you know, in my book I detail all the digestive enzymes, all the signs and symptoms of deficiency, all the causes of deficiency and the, favorite, my, the sort of best protocols, my favourite protocols and supplements that I use to actually get on top of it, okay, because you cannot get on top of histamine issues when you have digestive enzyme insufficiency. Um, okay. So Luke's got a question. Um, okay, this is a good one. I just need to take, take a cut, sip of tea, guys. So this is a good question. Luke's saying, I'm taking Nexium for reflux. What should I do? So Nexium is one of these proton pump inhibitor drugs that reduce hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Now, it causes huge problems, you know, like it absolutely reduces hydrochloric acid. It's going to cause a breeding ground for bad bacteria to grow in the small intestine. That's going to cause SIBO, huge histamine issues. It's also going to hinder the ability to activate pepsin, right? So as, as I was saying in the beginning, pepsinogen, is released, it's inactive, and it needs to be activated into pepsin by hydrochloric acid. And pepsin is what breaks down and digests protein. Okay, so with with Nexium, you become low in hydrochloric acid, you become deficient in B12, you become deficient in protein, deficient in methylating amino acids, the sulfur-based amino acids. Um, and you also are likely to get um, you're also likely to get SIBO. Okay, so what you really need to do is you need to get yourself onto well, probably number one, work out the cause of having high hydrochloric acid in the first place. It's very rare just to have high hydrochloric acid just because you do. It's usually because you've got inflammation in the small intestine which is stimulating the release of histamine and histamine stimulates hydrochloric acid okay it does that by the h2 receptor so you're just getting all this hydrochloric acid potentially not when you're eating a big steak but at, at sort of after a meal and you get reflux so test SIBO address the SIBO do the dysbiosis low histamine diet get your levels down okay a really good supplement for reducing the, the sort of the histamine in the stomach 
is Toxaprevent. The sachets will reduce histamine in the stomach. So once you've done that, you will be able to wean off the Nexium most likely and not have any issues with reflux. Okay, so it's, it's important to, um, to Luke, it's really important to try and work through that to come off it. Um, so Nicole's got a question. Is it true that celery juice increases hydrochloric acid? Yeah, it, it does, Nicole, but the thing with celery is very, very high oxalate. So, you know, it's, it's something that I would avoid because any, if, you're, if you're sick, if you've got histamine issues, if your gut's not good, if your gut microbiome's not good, there's a real potential for oxalates to breed in that environment. Firstly, because you need a good, healthy gut microbiome to break down oxalate. And if you've got histamine issues, then potentially you don't. If you've got dysbiosis, that's a breeding ground for yeast, and yeast actually contains oxalates. If you have SIBO, you are deconjugating your bile acids, and they are therefore binding up your, your calcium, and calcium you need to break down oxalate. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's just a bit a bit of a tricky one because you, you just might be because you need to drink so much celery in a juice to get the hydrochloric acid, you might actually be increasing your oxalate just too much and, and you, won't, you won't really understand what's happening because oxalates can, they can they, they, they're tricky and they cause strange symptoms, so it's really, really hard to monitor it. So I generally avoid doing celery juice. Um, so Fiona has a question. She wants to know if I um, treat patients in England. So, Fiona, I actually do. I've got lots of patients in the UK, up in Scotland and in London and sort of England. And it's not a problem for me to see patients in the UK because I can get all the testing done through BioLab. So BioLab in London are brilliant. They have. I'm a, I sort of, I'm a practitioner with them and I can access all the functional medicine testing. So I can do SIBO testing, stool testing, any bloods, any hormones, organic acids testing. So it's actually no hindrance at all for me to see patients in the UK because I can get the testing done for them. They also have a really great dispensary called Amrita, which do stock a lot of the um, products I do use in Australia, some of the Australian brands that I love and know. So it's, it's quite an easy thing to deal with patients in the UK. Um, so Nicole's got a question. What do you recommend for calcium if you can't tolerate dairy? Um, so um, Nicole, dairy is not the best form of calcium. It's high in calcium, but it is actually inflammatory and acidic. So effectively, um, it's, it's not the best form. You want more forms that are alkalizing forms. And when we, um, so more alkalizing forms of dairy are going to be green leafy vegetables um, nuts like almonds are a really good for source of calcium. Edamame beans are a good source of calcium. Um, tin fish with bones are a good source of calcium. Blackstrap molasses is a good form of calcium. Okay, so they're, they're actually more alkalizing forms. Um, but if you are low, if you need calcium to bind up oxalate, then calcium citrate is definitely the form. You take it with magnesium citrate for the balance. You need a balance between magnesium and calcium. And the citrate forms are alkalizing and they break, they, they bind up to oxalate to extract them. All right, guys. So I think that's it from me today with digestive enzymes, but it's, it's something that you can't ignore, okay? So digestive enzymes, if there is a deficiency, okay, it is going to cause issues with the gut and if you go and treat your SIBO, right, and the cause of your SIBO is digestive enzyme insufficiency in the first place, if you don't correct it, then it's just going to come back. All right, guys, I will see you on Saturday. Thanks.